Hello everyone, my name is Mads Barami from Wolfram Research. Welcome to the seventh session of our live coding series with Andras Lauschke. If you are joining us for the first time, Andras has a master's degree in financial mathematics from the Technical University of Berlin and he has been using Wolfram technology for more than 26 years. During these sessions, Andras will be live coding the key features of Wolfram language that every data scientist should be able to manage properly. During the first session, he focused on the operation notation and showed simple applications. The following four sessions, Andras discussed association, dataset, query, and web-based data scraping. The first part of an introduction to the outlier detection method was also the last session. You can find Andras' lecture recordings on the Wolfram YouTube channel. Andras has also uploaded his notebooks together with some homework on your Wolfram community. Today, Andras will give us the second part of an introduction to outlier detection methods. Without further ado, let us welcome our instructor, Andras Lauschke. Yes, Mats, thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my seventh session. This is going to be part two of the outlier detection. Last uh, session, I gave a gentle intro into outlier detection and showed some simple applications, some simple methods that don't really require a lot of uh, advanced understanding. Today, we're going to be looking more specifically into find anomalies. That is a new function in version 12. And it is incredibly powerful. It, it really uh, is deserving of its very own session. I'll start today with a couple of reminders from probability theory. I think um, that, that needs to be understood because it is really based on sound uh, probability theory. And then I will give a mathematical intro to find anomalies. I'll show you how it works. And then come some simple applications, some advanced applications. Then I also have to give you a couple of caveats. There are some things that uh, may throw you off track if you're not prepared for them. My next session is going to be about the date, time and calendar functionality that we have in the kernel. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Um, I want to begin by putting this a little bit in a context. I like to have a little bit of a map in front of me when I start walking into unfamiliar territory. And with this picture, I'm showing you a map. If we are putting this in an AI context, we have to understand that anomaly detection falls into the category of unsupervised learning. So you're trying to find hidden structure in the unlabeled data. This is very similar to clustering. It doesn't require any training or labeling of data. And that means that the amount of training uh, required is fairly low and the sophistication of the machine learning models is also not exactly the greatest. So we find unsupervised learning here in the lower left quadrant. This is a slide from Andy Jesse. He showed that on reInvent 2018 in Las Vegas. He is the CEO of AWS and presented this slide. And I think it's, it's a meaningful way to show us where on the map of the entire artificial intelligence universe we are, right? So our models are not, are not super sophisticated, but they also don't require a lot of, of training data. The story looks very different when we're looking at supervised learning or reinforcement learning. Okay, so let's jump into find anomalies, uh, which is really based on very robust probability theory. It's not that the box plot that I showed you last time is not based on robust probability theories. If you reason on quantiles or quartiles, this can be very powerful, but uh, quantiles are not the whole story. So First part, I'll give you some math to understand the inner workings a little bit deeper. And in the second part, I'll show you find anomalies applications. So first I'll give you a quick recap of probability and probability density. This is quite important and I'm going straight to the Wikipedia for this. Um, a probability is the fraction of times you expect to see an event occurring in many trials. 
and the definition of a probability density is the value at any given sample or point in the sample space that can be interpreted as providing a relative likelihood that the value of the random variable would equal that sample. So I have to also give you a warning that in general, probability density and likelihood are not the same, but in the continuous case, you pretty much can, can take them to be the same thing. This curve, the probability density curve, uh, is also sometimes called the likelihood function. And in the discrete case, that is typically not the case. In the uh, continuous case, which is what we are going to be dealing with, you can pretty much uh, consider the probability density to be the same as the likelihood. In a more precise sense, the PDF is used to specify the probability of a random variable falling within a particular range of values. Right? We here in the continuous case. I'm only talking about the continuous case. As opposed to taking on any value, that's what it would be in the discrete case. Right? If you throw the dice, when then there's only six outcomes. So you can count them. And this probability is given by the integral that this variable's PDF over that range has. That is, it is given by the area under the density function, but above the horizontal axis. Well, that's just the definition of the integral and between the lowest and greatest values of that range. The probability density function is non-negative everywhere and its integral over the entire space is equal to one. All right, so let's look at this and I'll just pick the normal distribution for the following example. We're gonna look at another one afterwards. So there is the normal distribution and I have to distinguish it from the non-standard normal distribution. There is the standard normal distribution and that means the parameters mu and sigma have their typical standard values. Mu is zero and sigma is one. And in the general case, that is not the case, right? But if you leave them out, if you leave out mu and sigma, you get what is called the standard normal distribution. But there's also the non-standard um, normal distribution, right? And then we have these parameters here. We have mu and we have sigma in, um, in our distribution. That is when mu is not zero and the standard deviation sigma is not one. So, Let's look at the uh, PDF, um, specifically the PDF a little bit closer. So on the curve, we have the probability density and the integral is the probability. It starts at minus infinity. We're integrating from minus infinity and are going up to, a, to, to the value where we want to end the, the integration and um, so the area is the probability and we can move the mu param parameter around here and it doesn't really matter where our mu is. The probability is the integral starting at minus infinity and then mu and sigma are really uh, sometimes also called shape and location uh, parameters and we can see very clearly, I think in this in this diagram, that the probability density is the point on the curve. That is the density function, and the probability is the area under the curve. And area means integral. Okay, so let's pick a specific example, and in the kernel we can give PDF our parameter value, and then in this case here I'll pick x. In the general case here, you see that this is a formal parameter. You see the dot under the X. So when we don't give a parameter, then we get it with a formal parameter. And if we give it a specific parameter, then we use that one in the PDF definition. If we leave it out, then it's a formal parameter. So here we use the PDF of the standard normal distribution using X as the independent variable. And we need to verify that it's a distribution. So the integral from minus infinity to infinity um, must be one. And the PDF must always be negative. And we have two more criteria. 
um, the PDF must always be real and integrable. Okay, well, we see this by design here um, that this function is always real and integrable. If the function is not integrable, it's not a probability density function. And if it's not real, um, then also we don't have a probability density function. So let's look at the help browser definition of find anomalies. It attempts to model the distribution of non-anomalous data in order to detect anomalies. That's out of distribution examples. And examples are considered anomalous when their rarer probability is below this value specified for the acceptance threshold. So I probably will not uh, talk much about the acceptance threshold here other than to say that it's a variable parameter. There are good reasons to say that a, an, an acceptance threshold is like a thousand and that's the default or one over 10,000 or one over a million or just one over a hundred, right? So that is very um, application specific. But we should zoom in a little bit on the rarer probability. Um, when the rarer probability is below the threshold, then we have an anomaly. So we need to look a little bit closer at the rarer probability to understand it. It computes the probability that the PDF of one distribution is less than the PDF of the same distribution evaluated at X, the independent variable, when Y is uh, distributed the same as the PDF of X. So this probably needs a little bit more explanation. Uh, keep in mind that in this definition, we are requiring that Y is uh, distributed according to dist. And in our case, we are going to be using the normal distribution, the, the standard normal distribution. And we have our independent variable X. The fact that you see Y is distributed according to dist already tells you that Y is not our independent variable. X is the independent variable. But dist must be the same by definition here. It's also logically clear that they have to be the same distribution. So the probability that this PDF is less than the PDF used for our independent variable. That is the rarer probability, right? When this is less than the PDF of the variable that we're using and the probability of that. So we also need to explain probability in a moment. So let's start with, a, with the help browser example. When you look at this in the help browser, they're using three so we'll use the same number there. And remember this number, you're gonna see it a few times now, right? It's the complementary error function of three over the square root of two, and the numeric value is 0027, right? Remember these, these two numbers. So let's try to dig in and understand these results based on rarer probability. Um, let's take the definition directly. Right? We've said it's the probability of this PDF less than that PDF. Both are from the same distribution. So I just put it in here. Probability of this PDF less than this PDF. And Y is normal distributed with 0, 1. And it's the same distribution that we're using for X. And if we evaluate it at 3, like in the help browser, and we get our, our, our 27. But this is the... Um, entire expression that we're getting for this probability. Uh, this is before the evaluation. So if we're looking this specifically for x, we can insert x here, right? But, um, for, this, for this value x, we can take 3. And then things get a little bit um, simpler. We immediately get, again, the complementary error function of 3 over square root of 2 and our 0 0.027, right? So things get immediately much easier when we can plug in a specific value um, as soon as possible. If we keep it general, well, then we still have this complicated uh, formula. Keep in mind, this is the formula that we get for the standard normal distribution. If we use a different distribution or we don't use zero one parameters, this looks different, right? Because this, those were the inputs. If we change this, or when we change here these parameters, we get a different result. So this is just for the normal distribution with standard parameters. Okay, um, next I would like to zoom in a little bit on these exponentials. 
because instead of writing PDF of the distribution of the parameters of the var variables, we can simplify this a little bit um, because the PDF of this standard normal dis distribution is just e to the minus y squared over 2 divided by square root of 2 pi. And um, we can make our lives a little bit easier when we can rewrite this a little bit. So first I replace these um, PDF of normal distribution, parameters, variable with these uh, PDFs directly. Okay, we don't really see um, a major improvement in, in terms of simplifying this. We get the same things, but that also shows us that these are the correct uh, PDFs. And let's put them directly into this probability function. And now things are beginning to look a little bit simpler, right? We again have these uh, two expressions of the same number. But I'd now like to simplify also this one PDF less than the other PDF business. And I want to apply the integral for probability directly. Remember uh, the definition from above. The probability is an integral from minus infinity to, um, to infinity. So let's dig deeper on this. Let's look a closer look at probability. It is defined as follows. For a continuous distribution dist, and that's the case here, the probability of predicate is given by the integral over the Boole expression, that's the 0, 1 um, uh, Boolean expression of the predicate, times f of x, where f of x is the probability density function of distribution. So note that here we have a product in the integral. It's Boole times the PDF. Right. That's the definition of the probability. And that is also a fairly typical uh, straightforward definition. But note it's an integral. That's important. The probability is always an integral. And this is here a product in the integrand. Okay, show me. So here I integrate directly. See that I've replaced probability with integrate. I'm now doing the integration myself. And here you see the Boolean expression times the PDF. And this is the PDF that's using y, right? Because that's the same as here, the lower value in this uh, comparison, which means that uh, it's not the independent variable. Three would be the independent variable here from, from our example. And we get our numbers back. Okay, so we like the outcome, but what's that business of integrating over bool? Let's try to understand this Boolean expression here. And we see that we get these triangles here and we see that two triangles are at the bottom, that is zero, and two triangles are at the top, that's one. So if you're multiplying with this expression in the integrand, then whenever the, the Boolean expression is zero, we're effectively annihilating the integral. If, if the integrand is zero, well, then the integral is, is zero in that interval. So I think about this as this Boolean function lets the integral live where it's one and it annihilates it where, where it's zero because we are, we are multiplying with this Boolean expression. So this Boolean expression here now imposes additional constraints on the support of the function. So this is called the support. The support is the interval where the function is not zero. So where we have one here and we're multiplying with it, then we have support there, unless the other factor that we're multiplying with is zero. And where we have a zero here in this Boolean expression in the integrand, then we don't have any support there because it is zero. So at zero, it annihilates everything, and at one, it lets the function live. So in our case of three, if we are injecting the three now here, instead of keeping it variable, you note here this was an x, and here I'm now putting in three, which now means we're getting um, this plot. We have effectively reduced one dimension of this plot, right? This is now uh, plotting in x and y, but in the expression to be plotted, we only have one independent variable now, y. Our three is now fixed. But that's really a one-dimensional function because this is a constant number. Let's look at that. This is a constant number. 
So it's really just a one-dimensional problem. Let's look at it in a one-dimensional plot. So this is how we are defining the support, right? From uh, minus three to three, we don't have uh, support. And outside of this interval, we do, right? It's this three here that defines these cutoffs. Okay, so now let's plot the whole thing. In the past, in, in, in the expressions above, I was only showing you bool. Now let's uh, multiply it with the PDF in Y. That's important that we are plotting this in Y here. And our independent variable is you now here in the, in the Boolean expression. And now we see again where it's zero, where the, where the support is zero, we, we have nothing. But where it's Y, we can actually see our, um, our PDF that is uh, defined through Y, right? So, um, I mean, the whole thing is, the whole thing, if, if we let the support be everywhere, then of course, we are getting this Gaussian curve um, back. But that's not of interest here. What we want is really uh, multiply with this Boolean expression so that we are getting a proper definition for our probability, which I'm showing here with the integral. So you see how Boole enforces the additional support restrictions. It collapses or annihilates half of the entire two-dimensional plane, right? This is 50% of the two-dimensional plane that we are annihilating. And in the other 50%, we let this um, PDF live. Okay, but that's just the support function. To actually get the probability, we now have to integrate this from minus infinity to, any, to infinity. Okay, let's do this. Let's call it int. And this takes a little bit. These expressions are fairly complex, but I'll simplify this in a moment. And once we have it, let's inject our three and we get our number back, the 0027. Okay, so this expression bool of the y-based PDF less than the x-based PDF is actually equivalent to bool of y squared less than, uh, I'm sorry, y squared larger than x squared. And that's gonna be your homework. Show that these uh, expressions are equivalent. Right? I mean, it's, it's clear that they're dividing the space 50-50 because um, we have a y and x um, in the square and that's what makes it possible to rewrite it. We need to keep y squared and x squared, but these two Boolean expressions are similar. They are, no, they're actually the same. I'm sorry, I misphrased. They're, they're, they're equivalent. So let's put that here as a simpler expression in the Boolean integrate, I call it integral two. And we are now getting an expression that is uh, a little bit simpler. And we inject three and we get our number back, right? And you see that this looks quite similar to what we had before. And if we set X to three, then we are getting our three back, right? We're squaring it and it's real. So we are taking the square root again. So we're getting our three back. Um, but we have to do it this way because there could be negative inputs, right? So a minus five will have to become a plus five again. And um, that's why we're seeing here the square root of the square. If we guarantee this to be real, this should, I think, even simplify. Um, if we take this x as a real, we're getting the absolute value. Okay, we're getting the absolute value, right? So this is really equivalent. This would also work for complex numbers. Um, and we're just getting the absolute value of this again. Okay, so, and let's look at the support again, and we see it's the same support that we had before. And now let's plot the resulting probability integral. And here we are, that's what it is. That's our uh, solution and this is now equivalent to the rarer probabilities because we computed it as the probability integral. And a couple of observations. It's symmetric around zero. It has to be, right? We are not caring um, about making a difference between outliers above or outliers below. And it has to go to zero for x going to plus minus infinity. And at zero, it has to be one. Just these are the natural expectations that we would have of a 
probability that represents the rarer probability. So take note of this shape. And if we do it with the simpler version, uh, with that simplification, then we are getting the same curve. Um, in principle, we should not verify they are really the same. We can check if the diffs are zero. Okay, that's not entirely totally scientific, but decent. So the physicist would say, yep, that looks similar. The differences are zero. That confirms the proposition, so we are all set. And the mathematician should say, I'll believe it for now, but uh, we're not done yet with the proof. So if we plot the differences, we really get zero pretty much everywhere, right? Um, but a more refined method would be to use refine, and then it's also mathematically accurate, right? Uh, take the same expression here, and instead of plotting it, um, I use the refine function. Uh, I need to say that it's real because this may not be the same for complexes but we're getting a zero. And let's look at it directly. Let's plot uh, the rarer probabilities. That is ground truth, right? That is what we are trying to understand by going into the probability integral, the PDFs, uh, the Boolean expression. And we see we're getting the same curve when we're plotting the rarer probability that's using the normal, the standard normal distribution. We're getting the same. And let's verify it's really the same. So again, the, the sloppy method is to just print for differences and the refined method is to use refine. And apparently that takes a little bit. Okay, we got zero differences and refine should also give us a zero after a while. And at this point, I want to show you a type of diagnostic plot that I use a lot when I'm studying approximation qualities. We are creating poles when they, we have zero error, and that means that they stick out. A pole sticks out um, graphically when you plot a function that has a pole. That's very visible, very easy to detect. And I use a function where we take the ratio of the two numbers to be compared, or the two functions that are to be compared. So this is a prox, and this is ground truth. And I subtract that ratio. If, if they're close, then there should be a ratio that should be close to one. So I'm subtracting it from one, which now means that should be around zero. I now want to take the log, but I don't want the numbers negative. So I throw apps around that, and then I take the log. So let's think about this. If these numbers are identical, which means we have an approximation of zero error, then this is one. One minus one is zero. Absolute value of that is zero. The log of that is minus infinity. So here we are clearly creating a pole that's very visible. But if these numbers are not um, the same or nearly so, then we're getting some kind of fraction here. Uh, it can be five or one over a thousand or a million or one over a million. So at that point, we are nowhere near uh, zero when we subtract it from one. And then we're just getting the logarithm of that number. Right. So it doesn't stick out as a pole. Of course, that can still be still be big. If this number is a million and this number is one, then we have a pretty big error. Then we have a pretty bad approximation. So we're doing something wrong to begin with. But if this ratio represents a function that is a reasonable approximation, this should be close to one. So here we should get a pole. And let's just look that these numbers are the same, we should now get something like on the order of minus 33, 34, 35. This is basically the number of correct digits and this is entirely numerical error. And uh, when we use refine here, we should get minus infinity. And this is what I think is, is very powerful and I think much better than, than just looking uh, for zeros in the differences. We really want to make sure that if we are trying to create a pole when these numbers are close, we really get minus infinity. And this works um, everywhere. This is not just point-wise. Refine really uh, guarantees us that we're getting a good result, mathematically proven, not just randomly sampled. I think this is a stronger statement here than this zero up here. 
Okay, so uh, here's your second homework. Think about the usefulness of this function, the log of the absolute value of one minus the ratio of approximation over truth. And don't forget, this is an absolute value in here, right? Not just the log, take the log of the absolute value of this difference to show the closeness of an approximation. Again, the idea is to create poles where curves intersect. Find this very useful uh, to study data, compare numbers, build functions around them, approximate them. It's in a way the opposite perspective to, 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 to convergence. When we're trying to get convergence, then we're trying to minimize a residual to show that, that, that we have a good approximation, that we have good convergence. Here we're doing the opposite. Here we're trying to amplify it by trying to create a pole where the error is zero. Right? It's the, the opposite perspective. We're not minimizing a residual. We're amplifying where they are close together. Okay, so now let's do this on another example. I claim that three times x squared is a probability tensor function on zero one. So let's check. Uh, let's just plot this function. You see it's zero uh, for negative numbers. It's zero for larger than one. And it's three times x squared on the interval between zero and one. So we check if the integral is one from minus infinity to infinity, that is the case. We can also refine this function and we are getting true when we are just simply saying, okay, is this larger than zero? Yes, it is. So that's the other criterion that we need. We need the PDF to be larger than, larger than zero or equal to zero. And now let's declare it a probability density function. And the way we do that in the mathematical system is we just say probability function of the function. And that guarantees us that the kernel understands it as a probability distribution. So here we have it with formal parameters x. Okay, so dist is now guaranteed to be a PDF. We have declared it to be one, but it's not just a function, it's a probability density function. All right, what does the corresponding cumulative distribution function looks like? So here for that, we integrate and I'm calling it CDF, not that this is a lowercase, so it's not the built-in CDF. And we are getting well, pretty much what we expected, right? It's the integral over three times x squared for numbers between zero and one. So we get x to the third. For numbers between zero. That's actually how I derived this function here. I've taken x to the third and differentiated it. So that's three times x squared. And for numbers less than zero, it must be zero because there never was anything before. From minus infinity to zero, it was zero. So the integral still has to be zero. And for larger than one, we now have to be at one, right? That's how we would expect this to behave of a CDF. Let's plot it. That's right. And here we have, here I'm now using uppercase CDF. So we're using the built-in symbol CDF for this and we're getting uh, the same plot. Okay, uh, the built-in PDF and with the built-in CDF, right? So we're getting the same functions now that we're using the built-in PDF and CDF functions. So uppercase PDF equals my lowercase PDF, upper CDF equals lower CDF. And let's just um, give it a couple of examples. For rarer probabilities, I'm using a list of these numbers and I'm getting these rarer probabilities. And let's plot the rarer probability. It looks remarkably uh, the same. And from the definition of rarer probability, okay, now my using probability of PDF1 less than PDF2, both with the same distribution. And we're getting, again, the same output, right? X to the third between zero and one. And now let's integrate it. And we are getting the very same result, right? So if you use the built-in probability function or you do the integral yourself, the integrate over um, this probability expression. That's the Boolean times the PDF and Y. We get the same expression. Okay, but that's just like the plot above. So we've proved it's the same result and we can do a sloppy check with a plot of the differences. We see they're the same and we can use refine and we see a zero. And if we insert our um, values, we're getting the same numbers that we had above. 
right here. These numbers are these numbers here. Okay, so it checks out. So in summary, I've shown you two distributions, the standard normal distribution and the user-defined distribution, and have gone through this process. So I've effectively shown you that rarer probability um, is built through a probability integral, but in, in, in the mathematical system, it's already defined there as the symbol probability. And then that integral is using the integral of uh, the Boolean expression, the Boolean of the predicate times the PDF in Y. And we're getting to the same results. We, we've shown that these functions are equivalent. Okay, in the next part, I want to show you some simple applications. I want to show you some simple applications of find anomalies. So I think this is directly from the head browser. If you give it a bunch of numbers and there is one clear outlier, then find anomalies will show you that outlier. It will easily find it. I think this is uh, easy to understand. We're dealing with numbers here, so we can quickly see this here. Obviously, that's a contrived example, but we see what it's supposed to be. We are getting one outlier that is detected from that list, but we're dealing with numbers here. So if we are not dealing with numbers, we, uh, we can get problems. So here we're using strings and strings really have, that was the wrong screen, sorry. And strings really have uh, no meaning for this, right? Find anomalies can't really compute anything sensible. We are seeing something that, that doesn't make sense to begin with when we know that, that strings have no meaning. And unless we can give these strings some meaning, like we tell the system what actually a cat is or what a dog is or a cow or a bird, we cannot really expect any meaningful outcomes here. So find anomalies just uh, picks the cat. And this would be now the anomaly. This would be the output. Here we're getting them as booleans. True, false, false, false. Here we're getting the anomaly rarer probabilities. And for some reason, the system says that this is the lowest number. The fact that we have these two numbers here don't matter. It's a it's a question that I think already makes uh, no sense, and therefore we cannot expect anything sensible to come to come out of this. But if we now go to numeric data, for example, if we uh, convert these to string lengths, then suddenly we do have an outlier, right? Because we have three, 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 four. And here, find anomalies correctly finds us. The list of anomalies is four. It's in position one. As booleans, we get false, 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 true and we get the rarer probabilities. Here is the rarer probability in the list of all, um, of all the uh, rarer probabilities. We get it here in the last position. You can clearly see that this is the lowest number. It's 10, time, it's 10 to the minus 5.1 billion, right? That's an insanely small number. I'm not saying that this is a big number here, but um, it's not on the level of 10 to the minus 5.1 billion. So we're getting um, a sensible output here. It detects the fourth element in the list as the outlier. So uh, let's look at the 2016 presidential election results one more time. I think after this, I'm really done with this example. There is something that we can also see in here. And the anomalies that are found now by find anomalies represent the big uh, numbers in the big counties. And that's why I'm also showing a select of all the county results where the absolute numbers are larger than a million. So let's run find anomalies for this. And we can see that we are getting the big counties. The second section here is uh, created with the select. So these are the these are the four counties that have more than a million Republican votes, more than a million Democrat votes, or of course more than a million then in the total. So this is the Democrat column, this is the Republican column, this is the total column. 
And we're seeing that it's four big cities. Maricopa County is Phoenix, Los Angeles County, Cook County is Chicago, and Harris County is Dallas. And we see that all these four were, count, were found, Maricopa, Los Angeles, Cook, and Harris. And the other ones are also big cities, and not quite Oglala, but Salt Lake City and uh, Utah, is, Utah County is also somewhere there, Provo, I believe. It's a city near Salt Lake City. Okay, so here we have these big numbers, and this is basically what we are finding under these find anomalies. I think another anomaly would be maybe a negative number, but we don't have negative numbers of votes here. So when we have large positive uh, integers, then these anomalies are restricted to finding these, these biggest numbers here. We have two options, two method options. There is the kernel density estimation and multinormal. And they can give different results. There is definitely a probabilistic element in find anomalies. And it shows when we use different, what am, I'm jumping here. When we use these different methods. And I want to show you the anomaly count, the anomalies and their rare probabilities. So here we have 15 anomalies. And uh, here comes the data. That's the data section for, for that. And here in the last row, we have the anomaly rarer probabilities. So here we have two times 10 to the minus 22 to the minus 172 and so forth. These are all small numbers and they're all triggering below the acceptance threshold, which by default is one over 1000. So this is how we have detected them. This is how we have triggered them. When we use the multinormal method, we only get seven outliers. Here they are. And again, they are our usual suspects. It's Maricopa, Los Angeles, Cook, Harris, Salt Lake City. And again, small numbers in the last row for these rarer probabilities. They fall under the threshold of one over 1000. Okay. And recall from last session that the box plot was detecting several dozen outliers for the Democrat percent numbers. It was based on quartile based thresholds. And you'll remember that the rule was quartile three plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. And I had emphasized it's a malpractice to use the box plot on skewed data. And I think find anomalies would be a much better approach here than the box plot because it's returning a reasonable number of outliers and it's based on rarer probabilities and not on skewed data with quartiles. That's bad judgment, that's, that's wrong judgment to use the box plot. So let's run through this again. Let's apply the rule of uh, quantile three plus 1.5 times interquartile range and we get 76 outliers. And I think that is absolutely too much for a uh, skewed distribution when we, when we know ahead of time that the data is skewed. And with find anomalies, what do we get? We get seven, yeah, I had already evaluated this accidentally. So, okay, now I get 13, but still much, much more reasonable, right? There is, as I said, a probabilistic element, a random element in this. If I run it again, I'm probably gonna get a different number again I'm now having 19, so uh, it's growing, but still much more reasonable than the 76. All right, who are they? This is the list of these outliers. And I think you can really justify calling them outliers when the 0.78%, can we go below 78? 77, yeah. So I think it's justified if you consider a Democrat percent number of 77, 78%, those would be really outliers, right? When, when an entire county votes uh, with 78%, that, that would be an outlier. And I think this is a reasonable way to argue then that, that they're the outliers. This is the lowest high that, that we have here. And the highest highs would be something like, what is that, 92? Um, I think it was Los Angeles that, that had the highest. Oh no, that was the absolute numbers. Okay, I don't know the high score for the percentage numbers. But when it's 77% or above, I think it's reasonable to call this an outlier. Okay, 
Let's advance to some examples that give you a different perspective on how we can use find anomalies. Let's try to find jumps in time series data. Let's take the euro, the currency, a euro versus the US dollar between January 1st, 2018 and well, recently. We can use find anomalies also to detect jumps in time series data, for example, in these price charts. So I should probably explain P data. This partitions the data in lengths of four with a three element overlap. So the way this is structured is, let's look at something like this. Okay, so we have, you see that every list here is always four elements in length and we have an overlap of three. So that means we have these three and that's going to be the overlap. So you see the 120, 115 shows up here again, but we have an overlap of three. So the next one, we have these three again here and only one overlaps, 2371, that's the first one here. So when this difference is one, four minus three is one, it's always the last one that becomes the first one in the next row, right? Let's pick this one here, 22562, 22562. Right. Let's make it with an overlap of two. Uh, it's called offset. I think of it as an overlap. And here it's now going to be the, the last two. So here we have 2616, 2616, 2115, 2115. We already had that. Or let's pick these two. 120, uh, 21, is here. And 122, 665, 22665 is here. So P data is now structured differently, right? It's not just a vector of numbers that we had before. It's now a vector of four element sublists. Okay. So when we now ask for uh, find anomalies, we're not just asking to find one outlier in, an, in a vector, in, a, um, in an n dimensional vector. We are giving it to find anomalies in these four element sublists. I think that's important to understand when we're now looking um, at these charts, because we now have to look back a certain amount of days in order to find sensible signals that were triggered. So here you see a jump and you see those four, um, those four. Here we also have four, you see one that here is one directly on the other. So these are always four consecutive data points where there is a jump in between because we're looking back four days. The four I think of as a look back period, then the four minus two or the four minus three would be the offset. So here we have two, right? This is eight points, but this is two triggers. So this is now a way that you can detect price jumps. They can go up, they can go down. And you could now look at them in the past, but still you can detect those signals and detect patterns and then program them, for example, into a neural network. Sometimes the problem in computerized trading is that people say, well, you're looking at the past. This is past data. Things change. The economy changes and the CEO of the company can change and can be tax changes and so forth. The point is that this detects patterns which happen for whatever reason. And even though you're looking at the past, you can now use these patterns and program them in a neural network. So it's not useless to look at the past. And just because you see these triggers here and don't know why they happened, it doesn't matter because you can detect those patterns and program them in a neural network. So four and three above is what I call a look back period. A four minus three is a one element look back period. So this is how partition works. And I think it is a very forceful, very powerful function uh, with partition. You, you, you have to get um, used to partition with offsets in your daily work when, when you work as a data scientist. Partition is absolutely essential. And okay, so let's expand this a little bit. I've wrapped a couple of things 
in a function func. I want to do this partition based on parameters because I want to change this the four and the three now, make them a variable. I don't want the training progress uh, output of find anomalies. I want it to work quietly. And then I want to show these date plots and list plots. So with this function definition, let's look at this data when I'm creating a tab view where I'm using different offsets. I'm using several of these pairs now. For example, the two one would mean that we have a look back period of two and we have an offset of one. So here you see jumps in the prices that are just from one day to the next. And this here seems to be a significant drop. And also here, but here it's going upwards, right? As I said earlier, it doesn't detect if it's going up or down. Here we're jumping down and here we're jumping up. So this was, when you, when you have a two one here, then that means just from one day to the next. When you have four three, then you have a four day look back period and the jump can happen anywhere in those in those four days. You can get very interesting patterns when you don't use uh, consecutive numbers. Here, let me sh still show you one. Eight, seven means it's just a one day look back. When the offset is seven and your first, your length is eight, you have a one day look back period. Or look at two, right? So here we have eight, two. Um, here we have eight, four. We're always uh, detecting interesting patterns with this one. Here we have a, a stronger move that here we didn't have, right? Um, see with 2.1, we're only looking at two days here. And the fact that a day later it jumped down again, we're not catching here, right? Because we're only looking one day back. This is 2.1 and this one here, the jump down, we didn't catch it. So we may have, we, we may be making a wrong decision here, but if we go further, then we catch those things then we can, can clearly catch those in, in these patterns that we're defining. And just for kicks, I've gone to a 20 day um, look back period to, to see what there is. So these are things that you can now model within your network. For example, this entire trough here, um, this entire valley, they give you different patterns on these parameters. And I think it's worth experimenting with them and then do a neural network and also do backtesting. What needs to be done when you're using moving average systems or systems that use a lot of lookbacks, you have to backtest them to, to make sure that you're not falling victim to something that's just a one-time ephemeral thing. You need to make sure that you really get sound rules for this and then you can start operating on that. Okay, so it's beyond the scope um, for this discussion, but look back periods are the key elements in moving average based technical training systems, which are, in my personal opinion, um, the most successful technical training systems. You have to use back testing and look at the actual results, but I think training systems based on moving averages and their crossovers, um, some of the most advanced technical trading systems. And then you can still augment this with neural networks. Okay, and the next one, I wanna show you something really crazy. You may remember when the Swiss Nas National Bank unpacked the Swiss franc from the Euro in the uh, middle of January, 2015. So it changed by 14%, I just looked at it. I should think it's 21% in a few seconds. And for a currency, that's an absolutely insane, insane movement. For a stock, a 10% move would be a big move. But for a currency, that, um, for a currency, a 10% move is, is insane. And for, for this, this, this was a move that has made dozens of businesses and especially brokerages absolutely bankrupt. It just drove them drove them out of business instantly. I know of two electronic brokerages that uh, were on the verge of bankruptcy. One actually was and then needed a predator loan just to survive under atrocious terms to get uh, money injected. Whereas the other side had enormous windfall gains, right? The Swiss National Bank just said, no, we're not gonna be using a pack to the euro for the Swiss franc. So, and it resulted in a 20% move instantly. And here, have a look at this, right? I think it's, it was 20% if I remember right. 
So I think we have 1.02 um, divided by, uh, what is it? Point eighty four or something like this, right? It, it was just an insane move. And you can really see when you use these triggers, none of them is missing it. Again, that doesn't necessarily make it a good trigger, these, these combinations, you have to backtest them. But it was so massive that actually none of them was missing it. We can go through all of them here. Everyone was, was flagging it. There's no one that was uh, missing this, this, this jump, this insane jump. Okay, so I'm now coming to my last uh, example. And I thought I wanted to use something that you would not normally think of when you use find anomalies or when you use a mathematical uh, function. I wanted to show an example where I'm using something where you really wouldn't expect that in a, in a math series. So as you probably know, there are major chords in music and there are minor chords. And in triads, you press three keys, right? A triad is three keys. And I have played a sequence of seven chords and six, yes, I think six of them were major and one of them was minor. So I want to find which one was the minor chord and I try to find find anomalies in there. So we have to we have to look at a Fourier spectrum. We have to look at the power spectrum of the tones, the chords, and also the harmonics and also the overtones that every chord creates in the sound spectrum. And if you are more familiar with it, what, what really makes the sound of, of a tone is what's called the timbre. And the timbre is really the total collection, the total set of all the harmonics and overtones that you have in a tone. That's what really makes something a, a sound. That's why plucking a guitar sounds different from blowing in a flute or hitting keys on a piano or whatever other instrument we may have. So I have an electronic uh, church organ at home and I have recorded about 22, 23 of these chord progressions on several pipes. They're called rings in, an, in, in, a, in a church organ. So I think I need to give you a little bit of an introduction on the St. Anne's in, in the UK, the St. Anne's organ. There are two manuals. One is called the Great, sometimes it's called the Grand Organ, and there is one that's called the Swell. And you have different ranks on these two manuals. You can couple them, you can change several things, them, but basically you have one manual for the Great and one for the Swell. That's how a typical church organ is structured. And we have several ranks for the Great, and you have to excuse the, some of these names sound pretty strange. These are terms that come from German, French, and Italian from the Middle Ages. So they have names that probably sound crazy to you. But we have several um, instruments now, have several ranks on the great and the swell. So we have an open diapason, small. Eight means eight feet. It's an eight foot organ. And on the great, I put this in the file name where the, where the rank is. And they are small, they are large and so forth, but, but the, the size, the octave is defined by the number of feet for the bass note. And I have recorded these chord progressions and let me just um, play you two of them so that you know what I'm talking about. So this is the open diapason small with eight feet. This is what the chords sound like on this instrument, on this ring. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, seven, right? So I've recorded seven chords and six of them are major. One of them is minor. And the question is, which one is the minor chord? So let me also play you the clarinet, eight feet. Okay, so I'm not going to play you all of them, but I thought I should play you two of them just to get a representative idea. So I'm now evaluating uh, this list. I'm turning it into a, an association of, of ranks. I'm not going to explain the entire code, but you can download it and you can also download the organ samples from my server uh, in case you're interested. Uh, in the next function, I'm just uh, defining half note steps that, that I will need for frequency detection. As you probably know, every half note step is the 12th root of two. That's why when you have an octave, you double the frequency, right? So we need these, these half steps here. That you see they're all the 12th root of two. Then I need some heuristics. I want to detect when the note actually starts playing and when it ends. And I need something for MIDI here, the A. Uh, the standard A is on MIDI note 49 and has a frequency of 440. Then I have a function with a bunch of, with a bunch of heuristics and they may sometimes fail, especially for high frequencies. I'm not saying this is the best way to do this, but this was just the, the easiest way for me to hack this together. What this basically represents is a bunch of heuristics to detect, to detect these frequencies and then their ratios, right? Then detect these frequency ratios because this is how we detect if something is a major or minor. From these uh, three notes, there are predefined frequency ratios and that's what makes something major or minor. And then I have a runner function that just brings everything together. It loads the files, uh, does some audio uh, manipulation then I'm taking it into chunks because I want every note to, to have about the same length and I want to start and stop when the note begins and ends. And then I want to print out the power spectrum. And I do this in a list log log plot that has to do with the fact that all this is exponential. I really can't go too much into this. I would be talking for way too long. But then I have some parameters for, for formatting it. I want 600, I want some filling in thick red so that the power spectrum really stands out where the frequencies, the, the main frequencies are. Again, we have overtones and harmonics, but I want the, the filter, the Fugier filter, really to show me exactly what main node we have there. And then I'm running it down and I'm printing the anomalies in the last one. And I like to put a box around it. And then, then I call this a data card. I think I had already mentioned that when something has about the size of a business card and it gives me a bunch of descriptive data, then I call it a data card. And I usually am satisfied by just putting a panel around it, a table form and then a panel around it, and then I'm printing them. So. When I'm running this, what you're gonna see is that you see the power spectrum, but as a tab view of the list log log plot, then comes another data card with the relative frequencies between major and minor, okay? So let's run it. This will take a while. So first I print the, the rank. Here you see the tab view and here come my data card. These are all the frequencies of the seven and here's the one that was detected. Tuciana a great, all of them and the one that was detected. And next one, here we have two, so we have one false positive. Lieblich gedacht, a great. Oh yeah, we have five, so there's four false positives. I'm not saying find anomalies is perfect here, but here we have one again, clear flute. We have, oh, that's not good. Uh, trumpet eight, we have five, that's not good. Clarion, we have one, okay, that's the right one. Next one, we have one Lieblich Bordon 16. 
we have one detected flauto magico that's a very quiet one okay we have one that's the correct one Geigen principle or we get one salicite we get one here we have two so we have one false positive clarinet we get one all right so you see you see uh, you get the gist of it right we first see the frequency peaks here and then we see what find anomalies detects uh, among these these frequency ratios okay i think this is through i think this is gone through let's look at some so you can see that for node one if we, if we look at them in pairs of three right you see that the one in the center is a little bit more to the right well that's a major chord and then the next one here a little bit more to the right these are overtones right the, only the first three are the keys I pressed those are the tri triads that I pressed and the ones above there are the overtones and you can see that sometimes the overtones are actually louder than the than the primary triad okay so for for note number two Again, we see this a bit more to the right here, right? So that's also the major chord. The third one, similar picture, a bit more to the right. The fourth one, that's another major. The fifth one, but now comes the sixth one, and you see that this one in the middle is a little bit more to the left. And you see this here with the frequency ratios. You can see that this one, the sixth note, right? I'm, I'm, I'm on top six here. The sixth one is the one that was uh, detected. So these are the typical frequency ratios that you would have. This is for three, four. This is for four half steps. This is for everything. I think this would be then seven half steps. And this um, is the tone in the middle. And if they're around 118, then that makes it a major. And for 126, that's the one that got detected. Okay, let's go some of. Let's look at some other ones. You can see that sometimes the center node is pretty big. It has a fairly big power spectrum. And then come the overtones that should usually, for the, for the most part, they should go down. And again, it's always the second last note that is detected. This is the minor chord and find minimum finds it uh, correctly. This one here is a very high pitched voice. You can see the four, so it's a four feet pipe. So it's a rather high tone. And we see that, that all the frequencies are shifted further to the right. But still, the fine minimum, my fine minimum heuristic found the minor chord at 1.26. Yeah, a Bourdon is, is, is a very low 16 feet. That's a bit big pipe. And you see that everything is broad and big and shifted to the left. Right, but it found the second last. It found the second last as the outlier. Okay, um, I won't spend any further time on this. I, I had fun program this a little bit and seeing here is see also that sometimes find minimum gives you too many false positives, right? This is way too many here. This is way too many here. So you may get false positives with uh, find minimum. Okay, all right, that was that example. Please observe the following. The anomaly, the anomaly is usually detected. Yeah, we're, not, we're never skipping it. We're never missing it. But we can also have false positives, right? It's only wrong when it also flags good ones. So we, had, we do have false positives. And errors increase with higher frequencies. All right. So, of course, we could have done this whole thing without find anomalies, right? In, in fact, we're going from something that could, in fact, really be determined deterministically to something that is now in the realm of artificial intelligence. So we have walked from something that could be done in a safe manner to something that is now able to give us false positives, right? We're now in the machine learning arena. But I think it's still sensible because you can have chords where the ratios are not known ahead of time. In fact, some people make music where they just program some frequency ratios and they don't even adhere to our keyboard keys to our notes right who says a great frequency ratio is one that maps onto our black and white keys right you can program for music just by looking at the actual frequencies and frequency ratios and make it completely computerized and optimized and none of the frequencies would touch our keys right so 
what if there's a chord or piece of music that you really like and um, you would like to know what chord ratio that is. So I think in that case, you could do it this way with a Fourier analysis. With major and minor, the chord ratios are known, right? But 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 in, in the general case, you get chords where you don't know what they are. It's not that all chords are major or minor, right? You can get music with chords where you have no idea what it is. And the different timbre, the different characteristics of the tones provide for additional overtones and harmonics that are in the music and that make it so so nice for the ear, so pleasing for the ear, or also so disgusting when you want to go with this. So in closing, I want to make the point that just the fact that we could have done that without fine anomalies, because it was only major and minor chords, doesn't change the fact that a Fourier-based analysis of, of sound, of audio, is still quite valuable. Right? You may have music as a sound file and want to understand the particular chord you happen to have. And for that, you just need this type of Fourier analysis. Okay, so in closing, I have to mention a couple of problems that we're getting with fine anomalies. I've already shown you one, right? And I've already shown you also that the output is not always repeatable, not always replicable. We've seen that sometimes running find anomalies on the Democrat percent data gave us um, what was it, 14 uh, outliers and then I ran it again and suddenly I had 19, right? 19 outlier counties. So it is definitely based on a certain random element inside and you should be aware of it, that, that this can totally ruin some of your analysis and also the courts here. If I ran this again, I would get a different result. I would never miss um, the anomaly but this long list of false positives, this sometimes is there and sometimes is not there, right? So there is a random element in it. So, and it's also sometimes to create, in quotes, anomalies that really are not anomalies. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with your data. For example, the Hilbert matrix is designed a certain way, right? There is a certain, it's based on a certain formula in, in the element, one over i plus y plus one, I think. And this is a very important matrix in linear algebra. Um, it is numerically very hard to, to evaluate when it's big, like thousand times thousand elements, and it has a big determinant, an absolutely huge determinant. So this is a matrix designed that way. It is designed to be uh, uh, one of crazy elements, very small, very large uh, determinant and numerically very hard to, to compute with and invert. But that doesn't mean that, that we really are dealing with um, anomalies when we are throwing find anomalies around it. For example, if we take find anomalies of the Hilbert matrix of a, of a five by five Hilbert matrix, we're getting the first row. So find anomalies already tells us, look, the first row in the Hilbert matrix is an anomaly, right? It is strictly based on the definition of rare probabilities. If we're using the definition of rare probabilities, then it is anomalous in that sense. But keep in mind, there's nothing wrong with your data. The Hilbert matrix is what it is. It, it is designed to be in a certain way. But then asking the question, find me an anomaly of it, that's asking the wrong question, right? When you use find anomalies on something it shouldn't be applied to, you're making the mistakes. It's not the mistake of find anomalies, right? So let's do it on a 15-15 Hilbert matrix. Now I'm getting eight rows, right? This looks like eight rows to me. Okay, are they anomalous? Yes, if you use the definition of find anomalies. No, if you, if, if you, if you say that the Hilbert matrix has a purpose and it is um, a sensible matrix to look at. And also if we look at the statistics about this, right? Here, uh, I'm using the five. Now I'm even having two outliers here, right? This was just one row. Now I'm having two here and look at the low numbers for the rarer probabilities, right? But again, that doesn't mean that that there is, uh, I'm sorry, these were the rarer anomaly probabilities, but it doesn't mean that anything is wrong with the matrix. So let's do it on a 15. And again, we see four and we have some pretty low numbers here. These are fairly low numbers. These four are the anomaly rarer probabilities, these four numbers here, 
right? It's an anomaly in the sense of the definition, right? But don't feel bad about your Hilbert matrix. It's a, it's a sensible matrix. And I usually find that kernel density estimation is a little bit more robust if you use that as the, as the method. But there are other things that seem to be inconsistent. For example, in a list 100, 100, I don't find anything anomalous there. So I would expect an empty list, but I don't get an empty list. It tells me that this number here is an anomaly. I don't think so, right? I gave it basically the same data twice. I don't see it there. Um, and here I'm giving it 1000 and 1000 and it gives me one. Now I'm using 1000 four times. Well, it gives me an anomaly. There is nothing anomalous in this. It's four times the same number. The, there are no differences, nothing. So I would expect it an empty list here or four times pi, right? I'm getting an empty list. Okay, so let me do it again. And um, now I get the output, now I get pi. Four times E, what do I get? I get E, four times A. What do I get? I get A. So this is something that doesn't quite please me. There should be empty lists in there. And that is sometimes a bit frustrating. And yeah, see, even when I use multinormal, I now ran it three times, two times I got empty list, which is what I would have wanted. Now I'm getting pi again. And when I'm using kernel density estimation, I usually get better results. Uh, third attempt, fourth attempt, fifth attempt. So I would, I recommend you use kernel density estimation, but uh, even then you can, you can still fool it. And let me give you a total random number based example. These are totally random strings, totally random generated strings. And why do I get anomalies here? Random should be random by, by itself. There should be no anomalies in random data. That's actually one of the definitions of random that it's basically all just white noise. And I keep, and I keep generating it and I always get anomalies, right? Here the 10, this, this, this tells you 10 anomalies. Okay, that brings me at the end of my session I am interested in knowing if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andreas. Uh, let's see. Uh, since there is no question, I think we could wrap up our session. This was the seventh live coding session with Andreas Lauschke. He discussed outlier methods. You can watch the playlist of Andreas' recorded videos on Warform YouTube channel. You can also interact directly with Andreas through Wolfram community. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful one.